Like, we should timestamp it, because what happens if, like, America nukes North Korea tomorrow, and then, like, people need to know that we recorded this before then, and that's why we don't mention it. If America nukes North Korea tomorrow, the dating of the podcast is definitely going to be our primary concern. Point. Hello and welcome to Pod Keep Our Land. It's what Louis Riel would have listened to. My name is Aaron Rennie. I'm your host. I'm joined by Patrick Meehan and Matthew Naylor. And we are a show about politics, parliaments, policy, and politicians. It's August 24th, 2017, and we are recording from Vancouver, BC. So we've got some good stuff on the show for you today. We're going to be talking about the grizzly bear trophy hunt in British Columbia. Then we're going to be looking at a few leadership races ongoing. Um, The federal NDP, the BC Liberals, and the Alberta United Conservative Party are all looking for a new leader. And then we're going to be looking at the issue of racism in Canada and the rise of white supremacy and the issue of commemorative monuments. So let's start with the grizzly bear hunt. Uh, What was the announcement? Uh, So uh, basically, in short, in the Great Bear Rainforest, uh, they're going to bar all grizzly bear hunting altogether. In the rest of British Columbia, they will bar uh, trophy hunting, which is when you hunt and kill a bear and take its paws and head is is what it comes down to, which has risen some political animosity from Andrew Weaver, the Green Party, who says that uh, that's not a true uh, trophy hunt because a trophy hunt ban because people will still be able to kill a bear and take a photo of it and and leave the head and hands behind you know the standard like leg up on the thing pose but but like wasn't andrew weaver in favor of the trophy hunt like he didn't want to ban it that i thought was his position and then brian cassavant who was the ndp candidate against him had the stupid little bear on his signs for this reason well, yeah, but I mean, Green Party positions are malleable, as any political party can be when they have political expediency. They just pretend they're not. Well, if there's anything, the Greens are expedient. Um, like, so the reason this is in the news, aside from the actual policy getting announced, was Donald Trump Jr. was up in northern BC recently uh, yeah. uh, and was doing some trophy hunting. So... I've read a fair amount on how trophy hunting is helpful for wildlife conservation Mm. in Africa. uh, And that is a particularly like specific set of circumstances from, from what I have read. uh, Well, only in the money it brings in, not in the actual hunt itself. Yeah, no, that's true. But like, this is what I'm saying is that in the set of circumstances in which Mm -hmm. governments don't have the money to put to conservation as opposed to like basic human services, which I, I still think probably should take a priority um there is a a dearth of money and therefore there is a a case to be made for raising money through trophy hunting expeditions this well i you know there are differences between british columbia and mozambique absolutely so um grizzly bear hunting was uh wasn't allowed prior to bc liberals coming to power 16 years ago and they they permitted it again and uh, it's been permitted for the last 16 years and the the NDP uh, hasn't hasn't completely banned the the trophy hunt of grizzly bears but they're saying that you can only take the meat you can't take the mm-hmm. actual trophies the paws and the head and the and the fur so do you think this doesn't go far enough to protect grizzly bear populations I, I don't think that the hunt was particularly dangerous to grizzly bear populations well, from well, from what I've read can, the, we, the can we be clear that, that none of us are none of us are experts in the field of conservation no true true enough okay but the, in what the Ministry of uh, Forest and Range, I think, or Environment, it was one of the two. The name changes. Um, was calling the grizzly bear harvest, as if, you know, the combines are going through and threshing up the grizzly bears, um, was... <sighs> They were more, uh, they were relatively bullish on the idea that um, a certain amount of grizzly bears could be harvested sustainably out of the population and not pose a long-term threat to the uh, overall grizzly population. And I think that's, you know, fair enough. Um, But there are other cases which I I put more stock in for why the ban should go into effect. Yeah, there's, there's... There's a whole host of suite of issues that come out of like a grizzly, the, the grizzly bear hunt issue, like just going down to the most 
most granular of like grizzly bears pull salmon out of the river and then leave the carcasses in the forest which adds nitrogen to the forest and that doesn't take into account in my understanding of all of this that isn't taken into account as the concept of like how sustainable this harvest is and so it, my understanding is it's a very complicated question that being said i think the ndp position uh, and the ndp policy as announced is stupid because <laughs> well of either, course you do either, no either ban the thing or don't don't do this stupid half measure where you can't take the pelt of the the animal well, out of the fork my so, understanding is it had something to do with indigenous hunting rights and things like that like any any justification like it's not the indigenous bands who are passing this particular law and if if one of them wanted to allow a grizzly bear hunt that is not possible now so i'm just talking about the provincial policy as it right. stands um there should either be if you're going I, like just something in me says that if you're going to go and kill an animal in a hunt then you should be able to use every part of it i, I feel something recoils in me against the idea of this you know, like partial carcass you could only take the meat of a grizzly bear they're not really a game animal right it it, it makes it clear that this is about discouraging the practice of trophy hunting the, the sport specific. yes but if they're going to do that just ban it I'm, i would support that ban fair enough i i do think it's interesting you brought up the, the donald trump jr thing and i do i'm, I'm curious because the timing there is really tight is i this, really hope that donald wasn't. trump jr was in in the province he was found on video to to be in the province doing a, doing what is ostensibly trophy hunting because he does that around the world because he's a man child uh and my question is did that spur an increase in opposition to the trophy hunt based on you know adjacency to the trumps i really hope not because that is a dumb way to make well, I'm, policy I'm, I'm not saying that's necessarily why the policy changed i'm saying maybe there was an uptick in people that opposed the, that opposed the I, I don't i the the poll that was taken before the election was 91 percent of british columbians opposed oh, yeah, the right. trophy hunt so yeah that's right yeah i mean maybe it it upticked it a little bit but to 92. It's, it's pretty universal that british <laughs> columbians don't want their grizzly bears being shot for sport i have a a general principle that i try to abide by which is that even though i don't like something i feel like i shouldn't be able to restrict other people from doing it and then unless there is a reason to do so other than my not liking it um which is why i was kind of reticent about the trophy hunt but there are good both environmental uh and economic reasons for imposing the trophy hunt ban, uh, including the very lucrative apparently bear viewing industry yeah tourism's huge yeah besides the grizzly bears they might be the biggest benefactors <laughs> Yeah, but like... Like cows, unless I'm going to Ugh. oppose the slaughter of all animals, which I can't like. Well, well there's a difference without between domesticated. There's a difference between domesticated animals. And yeah, but I'm not going to oppose animals. the deer hunt either. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, well, I, like I have friends that hunt, and I'm not, and I don't disagree with the, 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 their lifestyle. I think it's perfectly reason to go out and have a, like a deer hunt. I think the, the, the science is fairly clear that that is just, there are sustainable deer hunts because deer. That's fine. Um, okay, so let's move on to our next topic. Then uh, we're going to be going through. Uh, uh, several different leadership races that are ongoing throughout the country. Let's start with the BC Liberals. Um, uh, former Premier Christy Clark stepped down as uh, leader of the Liberals a few weeks ago. So who are our front runners? So who's in, who's out? I think Rich Coleman has said he's out unless he's back in again. Yeah, unless he pulls a Dunderdale, we're he's... not we're not going to see Rich Coleman sorry, in the race. Sorry, sorry. To pull a Dunderdale is to get yourself appointed interim leader and then uh, say you're not going to run and then halfway through the leadership race declare you are running and force everyone out of the race. And uh, where was Dunderdale? Kathy Dunderdale was a Newfoundlander. Okay. Uh, this is the, the most fascinating part of a leadership race, I think, is the who's in, who's out. Everything is possible. Nothing is impossible. Names get thrown about that are wildly impossible, but still get considered as, as likely. So we had Carol Taylor, uh, who uh, has had a long history in BC politics, was considered. She's now said she's out. We had Jess Johal, who has been in BC politics since 2013, when he harangued and harassed uh, Adrian Dix, the then leader of the NDP, while uh, Jazz Dohal is a member of the media. Uh, he is now out, uh, likely because he's only been in politics for about eight minutes. Uh, who's in, or who might be in? Um, well, the people who look like they are circling around the idea of declaring their candidacy are uh, Andrew Wilkinson. Andrew uh, Wilkinson, the former advanced education minister, 
Assistant Attorney General, uh, who represents Vancouver Colchena, the, the one of the more affluent riding seats. Yes, uh, Sam Sullivan, who won by just over like a couple hundred votes. hundred votes, couple hundred votes yeah. over uh, Morgan Auger in Vancouver Falls Creek, former mayor of Vancouver, uh, former community sport and social development minister for six minutes. Yeah, technically uh, <laughs> fairly divisive. I think he's probably the most hated by the left of almost anybody that could run. At Wait, least, at least in in the city of Vancouver, based on man, the strike the le- that he ran. Man, the left have got their priorities wrong. Oh no, think, I'm not. But... I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with it. But based on the strike that he orchestrated in the city. And well, I'm just that. Wow, what a what a the garbage strike. You the mean. garbage yeah, strike yeah, yeah. Right. where he he refused to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like garbage piled up for memories. months. <laughs> Wait, what what a misapplication of rage, though. So, I, I'm just saying that, like from from the perspective of the left. I think that Sullivan is probably more sympathetic to uh, some some leftist issues. I think yeah. he he bestrides an interesting, weird neoliberal middle. Well, yeah. I had a I had a little chat with him, and he called himself a green Tory. Uh, that would be a thing he would say. Yeah. So so who else is in or out? Mike DeYoung is definitely thinking about running. Kevin Falcon and, is thinking sorry, about sorry, running. Sorry. These are former cabinet ministers, yeah. primarily under Gordon Campbell, and then Mike DeYoung continued under Christy Clark. And uh, Kevin Falcon ran for leadership last time. Yes, and yeah. came second. Yeah. And then Diane Watts from Surrey, my own hometown, is maybe in or out. She's this, uh, every le- leadership race seems to have the the, the outsider who's going to come in and whip everything together. Last leadership race for the Liberals, it was Christy Clark. This time it may be Diane Watts, and it'll be interesting to see if she jumps in. So this is a weird phase of the leadership race, because it seems like the the kind of people that are being talked to is actually a, a very small pool. It's smaller yeah. than party membership, and it's smaller than the like general population, because these people are trying trying to see whether or not they can get enough organizational capacity together to mount a run. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and that first test is basically them in this pre-rules announcement period. Um, And then, like, once the first person announces, then they'll be off to the races and there'll be an announcement every week or two Mm -hmm. for a couple weeks and that'll, like, set the candidates for the race. So in this stage, uh, if you're a party member and you're an active party member, like yourself and myself have been over the years. Uh, as soon as the leadership announcement gets made, what's the what are you doing? Uh, I go and talk to different candidates. Like I, I try and and you're shopping for shopping for uh, shopping for a candidate for somebody to get behind. Yes. You. Yeah. It's it's the most interesting part of it. it's like the pre pre primary. It's it's where you're looking for who your campaign staff are going to be. It's looking for who who's going to be your supporters in different areas. Who's going to be your ambassador in different places. This is where you pull together your team. Where you pull together you know eight or ten people or even three or four people and you say hey can you do a study? Like, can you look at whether or not I can stay? And then they put together some paper and they come back to you and they say... Sorry. Or they say, I think we got a chance at this thing. And you put your head in there. Or they say, no, you can't, but that's clearly not why you're running. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, and what, what does that result in? That results in someone like um, Martha Hall Finley, yep. who got into the race to raise very interesting ideas and I think has carved out a specific part of the federal liberal party who are are very in favor of her kind of brand of business liberalism. You're, you're moving you're moving an, an issue forward. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're Talk, you're, you're you're moving an issue. You're moving a, a ideology. You're moving a uh, branch yeah. of the party forward because every branch of the party is going to find its candidate. Wait, do you mean parties aren't like single entities? No, <laughs> but no, I, I find it fascinating the, the different wings of a party. So now is the point where each wing of the party is finding somebody to champion, uh, and now it's really interesting to see who could or couldn't. And what? How do those conversations normally go from the the shopper's point of view? Usually in a bar. Well, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of questions are you asking? to the potential candidates and what are you looking for? It depends on whether or not the previous leader has resigned yet. Uh. <laughs> uh, well, I bet. I, but basically yeah. the question is where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, uh-huh. so, so it's a question of trying to figure out whether this person has an idea of where they want to take the party, what they want to do with the province and what they would do if they got to become premier. So so I guess you can look at it. Sam Sullivan represents sort of the urban intellectual wing of the party to a certain extent. The, the, the wing of the party that acknowledges climate climate change and so on. I think Andrew Wilkinson, similar vein, but a little bit more pro-business. Um, who else are we looking at? Diane Watts represents the Suburbanism. <laughs> Suburbanism? It's unclear what her ideology is based on how she was as a mayor. I, um, like the, Diane Watts is an interesting name to bandy about here because she just hasn't been particularly engaged in provincial politics all that much. Or federal politics, and she's an MP. Well, that 
I'm not going to speak to that. But she, like, was a, a relatively popular mayor of Surrey, but she... Hugely popular. You know, yeah. Like beyond, beyond anything. She, she destroyed opposition to the point where political parties disbanded they lost so badly against her. Right. And if the, the BC Liberals didn't do so well in the last election because of urban issues, perhaps Diane Watts, who was mayor of the fastest growing city in Canada, would be a, a good choice. For well, but it's a, you, know, you have a weighted vote. The, the Liberals had, the Liberal Party BC has a weighted vote system, as I understand it, similar to the Conservative Party. Yeah, the BC Liberal does, yes. Yeah, so every riding has the similar poll. So, so, same, so. same as the Federal Liberals as no, well. No. Yeah, and actually, I, I, I like the system. Um, and so you have to be able to pull support from all across the province, and I'm unclear that Diane Watts has that ability to do it, but we'll see if she goes into the race. Well, um, it's a question of what? campaign strategy. Like, yeah. Christy Clark's campaign very strongly targeted non-BC Liberal-held ridings mm-hmm. in the hopes of selling memberships there, yep. which um, is the next phase of the race. Once yeah. you announce that you have to start selling so, memberships. But, but who, before, we, before we move into the next race, uh, who else? We've got Mike DeYoung. What wing of the party is Mike DeYoung? I mean, like... I've never been clear on this. It, well, like, this is this is the genius of Mike DeYoung, is that he has, like, he, he's a federal liberal from Abbotsford, so he feels both ways. He's both <laughs> rough and smooth. Oh, God, please stop metaphors. Oh, he, he, is, he is both the jelly and jam of this particular race. <laughs> okay, so... Lemon and lime juice. Yeah, and then and these are some great campaign <laughs> slogans. Oh. Uh, and then you end up on that team. <laughs> well, and then there's there's Todd Stone, former transportation minister. He's been talked about. Has he said he's out, or is he given a statement? Uh, I I don't think he said anything one way or the other. But I would be surprised if he ran. But he's very much the interior candidate with that. Person. Yes, but yeah. also like an interior liberal leaning kind of person. Yeah, I mean he was a tech guy for a while. But yeah, so anyways, everybody gets their their brand. Uh, so then you move into the next phase which is once everything's solidified which is fighting for your votes and, and selling memberships and so the political operatives by this time have figured out what their game plan is not, not all of them there's always some free agents well no that's true but like the, the leadership campaigns have tried to figure out how they can get to their win condition yeah um, and for each race based on the rules that's going to be different mm-hmm. uh, because the BC Liberals have instant runoff voting and they have uh, a one member, one vote weighted by riding, there is a different set of win conditions than, say, a one member, one vote strict party or a um, delegated convention, which is the ideal way of picking leadership candidates, in my opinion, but that's neither here nor there. So another party about to pick a candidate pretty yes. soon. Yeah. Uh, the Alberta United Conservative Party. Um, that, that name never gets old. No, it doesn't. Yeah, notice that I said each word instead of using the acronym. Uh, so so th- <laughs> their, their candidates have been out there for a while now. Um, who are the front runners of, of that race? There are two of them, uh, and they are well, th- two of them now that one of them had to get kicked out of the party. Well. <laughs> And we'll get to him in a moment. But the two leaders right now are Brian Jean, who is the former leader of the Wild Rose, and Jason Kenney, who is the former leader of the Progressive Conservatives. I did air quotes right there around former, but this is an audio program, so uh, I feel like I should have uh, chosen some other way to convey my sarcasm of the fact that, like, Jason Kenney basically ran on a platform of, elect me leader of this party so that I may destroy it. So, so now that the merger's happened, you've, you've broken down into the two leaders. Uh, the one leader comes from the far right wing of the party, and the other leader is Brian also Jean. comes from the far right. It is Brian Jean, yes. Yeah. Uh, is you've got a, it, 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 one way or another, you're going to have the, the far right wing of the party. And this is the situation where the, little, the middle wing and the left wing of the party are left without a, a candidate to a certain extent. Partly because a lot of them, I think, are jumping ship, and they haven't figured out where they're jumping to. Um, but now we're in this stage of the, the campaign where the leaders have been set, a, set in stone more or less nobody else is going to come forward there are two minor candidates but they're unlikely to do very well um and so now it's it's gathering your your volunteers and selling memberships to people that don't have a membership so they can vote for your candidate and winning over members to your side yeah then that and that is a a stage of the leadership campaign which will continue yeah. until the membership cutoff date which is usually a couple of months before mm-hmm. the actual vote oh and obviously the other important is uh getting endorsements yes so th- there is this kind of endorsement sweepstakes that takes place for leadership campaigns and that um, involves like courting party luminaries and party bloggers and other current MLAs, current yeah. MPs, because you pull in the federal 
wing of the Conservative Party as well to, to, to side with one or the other. Elder states people. Yeah, pe- former leaders, if you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The NDP really generally generally have a number of former leaders waiting in the wings to endorse thing, people. Uh, and in, in the Liberals, the former leaders generally try and stay out of things. Who are the only people in the Federal Liberal Party who stay out of the backstabbing. Yeah, because they're, they're still letting their scars heal. <laughs> <laughs> do, do endorsements really make a difference? Yes. Yeah. No, I, I think um, I think they do. People it, use them as a heuristic tool to see where people who share their views uh, are backing. Well, and also, a, a lot of MLAs and MPs have a cadre of people behind them that support them and will. And 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 it's not it's not a feudal system. Like it's not they're not tied to them. But you, when your MLA that you support, even if you don't live in that riding anymore because you moved out of it, is going for somebody, you you get pulled into the movement as well. Uh, and it, it's a way to build that steam of, of volunteers, of support, of, of voters. This is not to say that MLAs are the end all and be all of the system because no. last time around for Christy Clark, she had the support of the only... least useful MLA in co- in cabinet or in Congress. I guess they were going to say history, yeah, but uh... that's possibly true. <laughs> also possibly true. <laughs> If you want to watch something painful, go try and find Harry Bloy's first press conference while he was a uh, social development I minister. still use that. I still use that press conference to this day as a training aid on how to, how not to give a press conference. Oh, man. It was so brutal. It was so but bad. Yes. So so you can win without. you. you the, the outsider coming in to shake things up but like, okay. is, is a winning strategy. And um, then, there can be only one outside candidate. There were also like a lot of party luminaries who backed Christy Clark. Um, mm. Like there, okay. there were people within the like maybe not the actual caucus, but there were people who were like active within the party, who people within the party respected and had ties to that brought people along to the Clark campaign. Right, I, I hadn't realized that, but that makes sense. Yeah, so there like, will you, always be people. You can't, in yeah. you can't run well, a campaign. And similarly, Jack Layton's leadership campaign was the same way, where he had very little caucus support, but he did have a huge amount of support from former former MPs, former party leaders, yeah. this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. Basically. Jack Layton and Christy Clark are the same person. <laughs> this episode is full of all sorts of sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. So what happened to our friend Derek Fildebrandt? <laughs> okay, so Derek Fildebrandt was a candidate. Oh. Derek Fildebrandt has been the most amazing, awful. There's something about the most self-righteous people in politics, left wing or right wing, where they're always hypocrites. Always, always, always. And Derek Fildebrandt is no different. Uh, the, 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 the first time I ever heard about Derek Fildebrandt was when the carbon tax was coming in and Derek Fildebrandt decided to go and buy seven jerry cans, fill them up and get a photo of him in front of his truck filling up jerry cans of gasoline uh, that he had spent, I think it was something like $7 in taxes to purchase these, the, 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 these, 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 these jerry cans themselves. And then the price of gas went down, even though there was a carbon tax. Okay, so that that's like a, a photo op and oh. like I, I can give him credit for that. but It only goes I, downhill from here. So Derek Fildebrandt, who has been really against the entitlement and abuses of elected officials and big government and how it costs so damn much, uh, was found to be leasing his taxpayer-sponsored apartment in Edmonton out on Airbnb when he wasn't using it for his time at the legislature. Of which he was getting paid $26,000 a year by the government to maintain. Mm Mm-hmm. Yikes. Then it comes out that he also was frequently double-dipping, where he would take his daily daily allotment of, 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 of food expenses and then also expense individual meals. So he would get paid for the day's amount of food and then also expense uh, his, his dinner. And this guy used to be the spokesperson for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Oh, yeah. The right-wingers especially get really bad about this amazing hypocrisy around hating taxes as long as it's affecting them, but being perfectly okay to take it from the government. Oh, well, they are entitled there. It's... So this thing about the Airbnb didn't go over very well. And to be clear, it's not illegal. No, nope, it just improper. I think I think the meal thing might have been illegal. The, the meal thing was an actual abuse of his uh, his position. But the yeah. the Airbnb thing yeah. was not. It is a but then, legal if immoral thing to do. But then it turns out he was involved in a hit and run that he just ran away from, which is arguably one of the worst things you can do in our society is just leave the scene after a hit and run. So right. now he's gone. So he's 
what I heard was that he's blamed the media on Facebook, and then he plans to leave the UCP to sit as an independent MLA. Yeah, because he's politically toxic for a little while. A little while. He might be done. I, mm, that'd, be so, that'd be such a shame. He is pretty adorable. So <laughs> if he was more popular, do you think he would have been able to, to deal with these things? Or if they had happened... like No, the, the no, thing no. Is, because most of these stories came out in like a two-week window. Well, right? okay, so there was that. But I, I feel like those were building up behind the sort of dam and when one thing came out that was like really uh-huh. bad they the rest were going to to fall but like hmm. the problem with this whole issue is that these hypocrisies struck at the core of his brand yeah like if it had been david swan it? who was who, who was the alberta liberal leader or was he mm-hmm. was the alberta liberal leader and uh he had been leasing out his apartment on airbnb it wouldn't have been that big an issue because yeah. like it's part of the rules and i'm entitled to this and blah 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 liberalism but that's but, that weird though the, the angrier you are in politics i find the more likely you are to be i think that it's so frequent that the people that rail against other people in politics are themselves nowhere near as good as they claim. I think part of this is hypocrisy i think also what, what i mean what i've noticed is canadians have this really intense attachment to the idea of fairness and we get really upset Mm. when people jump the queue or don't follow the rules or get something that not everybody else gets and it really seems to bother us like the it reminds me a lot about what happened to the the conservative senators um Mm -hmm. and their their um their claims, their um, reimbursement claims, that really bothered people, and I, and I do wonder if it's something about it's something in our our Canadian mm-hmm. values. <laughs> well, especially since we seem to be totally okay with spending twenty six million dollars to ferret out one million dollars of inappropriate expense claims, but right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter that it's costing us more. But yes, Derek Fildebrand, I I absolutely am amazed at how much somebody can have such a no good, very bad, downright rotten week. Well, it, it was brutal. It was, yeah. and it was great to watch because he is such a self righteous man about this stuff. Anyways, shall we move on to our last leadership race? Yeah, we've had our dose of Schadenfreude for the season. <laughs> <laughs> Feels so good. Okay, the federal NDP is looking for a leader. Who are the front runners there? Uh, well, we're down to the the, the, the final four. We've got Guy Caron, we've got uh, uh, Nikki Ashton, we have Charlie Angus, and we have Jagmeet Singh. And I don't know who's going to win. But what's happened is in the last couple of days is the cutoff for new membership is closed. So the ability to get new members to vote for you is over. The NDP use a one member one vote system, so it doesn't matter if you have all of your votes in Brampton and Surrey, which is to a certain extent. Extent Jagmeet Singh's strategy, or if you have votes spread across urban areas, uh, which is I think what Nikki Ashton's strategy is, uh, you need to just get 50% plus one in the final ballot. They do a, a ballot, and then I believe they knock off some candidates and have a final ballot two weeks later. Uh, it's really interesting to see because what's happened is since the cutoff, I have been contacted by more leadership candidates. And obviously, full disclosure, I am a party member at the moment. I've been contacted no. by I know more leadership candidates in the last since the cutoff. Than the entire campaign up until now. I got a robocall from Guy Caron's campaign. I've had endless emails from Nikki Ashton's campaign. I've had uh, a mess, uh, a, 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 what I assume is a nation builder text message from Jagmeet Singh's campaign, which is the, the system that they can use to send text messages massively. And so it's really interesting to see they're really reaching out to the undecideds now. But th- this is exactly what leadership campaigns should be doing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, because up until this point, their goal should have been selling memberships. Yeah. Now, the pool of voters is set. It is locked in. Uh, And so now everyone is fighting for the pie. And the interesting thing is, I keep talking to friends of mine who are also party members, and a lot of, very, very few people are sure who is going to be number one on their ballot. And not even just that they don't want to say it, it's that very few people know. I I have never seen a leadership race with so many undecideds before. It's a tough race, and I, I, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. Because all four candidates are, are equally strong, or because they're all equally meh? Like I, I don't know. I don't know if it's them? meh. I think a lot of people are, a lot of people, so Jagmeet Singh is, I think, the most, uh, uh, divisive candidate. I think a lot of people on the, the the left side of the NDP are really disappointed in his uh, a little bit of a here and there middling campaign in terms of his ideological purity. But I, I think know, he's almost Leighton esque. But I think uh, agreed, and I think a lot of people really like the breath of fresh air he brings. He 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 doesn't have a divisive style of politics. He he has a real build a tent style of politics, uh, and so that's that's the real division there. Guy Caron had it fought his way into I think a respectable position from where no one knew who was. 
was. Uh, and he came out with heavy policy, and people have come to really like him. And, and he, he's, he, he might be the policy heavyweight of the party now. Uh, that doesn't mean he's going to win, necessarily. Charlie Angus is probably the odd one out, I think, based on sort of some analysis, but he's well he's reasonably well-liked. Some people think well, he, he, his shtick is a little far. He's the one that's most closely tied to the labor movement, yes. from, from what I have seen from the outside. Yeah. Uh, especially tied to the old labor movement. I think Nikki Ashton could be seen to be tied to sort of the younger labor, far left uh, movement. And then there's then that which brings us to Nikki Ashton, who uh, I tend to think has a bit of a divisive style. I think that she has a, uh, if you're not far enough left, you shouldn't be in the party view. Uh, and I think that that sort of turns me off a little bit, but that also, by me. That also works really well for some people. And I think there's a lot of people for whom they <laughs> want the party to move farther to the left. So I, I have, I honestly have no idea how the first ballot could shake out. I think uh, if I were to put any bets, I would say Jagmeet Singh first and uh, Tra- and Charlie Angus last, and then I don't know where it goes on the next ballot. So because Jag- it'll be close. Jagmeet Singh looks to be from the outside the front runner. Mm-hmm. Um, Front runners, though, don't always win in these types of things. It's true, especially in in this kind of ranked balloting system. That, well, especially that, like yeah, in, in the federal conservatives, like an ABC race, which is like an anybody but you know usually sure. somebody whose name starts with a C. Maybe sing. Oh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> ABS right, uh, campaign. Where what you have is three part three three leadership campaigns whose whose supporters don't want to support that top person. Uh, I think you saw that with uh, was it Ignatieff? There was a lot of anybody but Ignatieff yeah. sentiment in that two thousand six. Mm-hmm. Uh, leadership race. There is some anybody but Christie stuff in in BC, but not mm-hmm. substantial. There was a lot of anybody but Brian Top in the last federal NDP leadership race, which resulted in Mulcair coming over the top and obviously worked out fabulously for the party. Uh, that's a joke. Never mind. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so now we're into the stage of the campaign. I, I, I find it really fascinating. Now it's the, the, the final stages, which is where it's pull together all of the supporters that you can, that you've identified as being on uh, on. Un, undeclared. Time to get out the vote. Yeah. So three races to watch. I'm sure we'll have an update um, shortly. But now I think it's time to change courses a little bit and uh, get into um, another topic. We are... So it's... Uh, I don't know about you guys, but it's been a pretty distracting two weeks for me uh, watching everything going down in Charlottesville and around North America, hearing the statements from President Trump. Uh, pretty disappointing words coming from him for those of us who op- oppose racial hatred um it's it's been pretty um tragic to to hear about the 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 nazi rallies the um the the death of the two troopers and um the the woman protesting the the nazi rallies in charlottesville um so it's pretty concerning we're we're seeing a lot of um an increase in white supremacy and white terrorism and hatred towards um people of color and uh, a lot of people are drawing um ties to getting of world war ii and and, um, and Nazism in Europe, and uh, it's it's really scary. And it's important to remember that this is not something that just happens in the United States. We've um, also been dealing with some uh, white supremacy here in Canada. Um, just earlier this year, in January, uh, six people were killed in a mosque after a terrorist attack by a white supremacists there. And uh, just this Saturday in Vancouver, there was a white supremacist rally. So, what do you make of this? A couple episodes ago, I mentioned something called the Overton window, which is the boundary of acceptable discourse in a society. And every time a white supremacist gets on TV or this kind of story appears in the newspaper or online or in your Facebook feed, it just inches the bounds of acceptable discourse a little further towards a very dangerous place. And so I am worried uh, whether it's through this sort of like ethnostate. Ethnostate is like, this is the thing I mean about the Overton window is that we're now using phrasing that we wouldn't have used 10 years ago that we 10 years ago we would have felt deeply uncomfortable using i still feel deeply uncomfortable I mean, using it but that's, like, and that's i think good yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I think back to like trent lott uh if, if anybody wants to google trent lott uh, he he was a republican congressman or senator i believe senator and he during a retirement party for for a deeply racist republican senator strom thurmond made a, a a veiled racist joke and he was thrown out of the party he was forced to not run again this was in the mid-2000s Today, that joke wouldn't be veiled, and that congressman would have been would not be in any trouble for it. And I think that that has that, like you say, the shift has occurred now where we're more okay with politicians, at least in the United States, being actually essentially publicly racist. 
So white supremacy takes a variety of different forms. Um, and, and one of the things that has been rising in Canada recently is the the Proud Boys. Man, it's difficult. I can't, it's, I can't tell if that's a 1980s vampire movie or a, a like a gay rights movement group. Oh my God. Don't, don't even care. It's worse. The, the, <laughs> the people, okay, someone actually said that the Confederate flag represented the same thing as the rainbow flag. And I, I'm like, oh my God, really? Dan, Dan Savage, wrote this fantastic article saying I remember it well it was 1976 when the gay states seceded to fight for their race to keep straight Half people San Francisco was gone <laughs> straight people as slaves and they fought for four long and bloody merry years to defend the confabulacy <laughs> and like so well, gay a, people are different from racists and while well, there is a Venn diagram that has some overlap there that is a uh, different thing I think gay the, rights and southern pride are rooted in different philosophical places the false dichotomy the, 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 yeah. the both sides the both sides are the same there was violence on all sides all those, those but this is rhetorical technique yeah, that yeah. people will use to and move people, the Overton window and, and people have been using since the DC segregation era. This was a active campaign used by the, the, the segregationists in the 60s was, well, both sides are pretty bad. And that worked then and it's continuing to work now and it's really aggravating. Yeah, I, I think about, um, you know, you'll see like a, a television interview where you have uh, one person who is a climate scientist and then you bring on somebody else who's a climate a denier. Lunatic, yeah. a lunatic. And you set it up as like a yeah, fair debate uh, when, when the climate denier does not represent, you know, 50% or even mm-hmm. a significant portion of well, they, they represent a very small portion of people who refuse to read science or believe it and and it, it creates this this myth that there's some kind of e- equality there or equivalence yeah. when there truly is yeah it's and, it's the balance fallacy like mm-hmm. the idea sure, that yeah. there is always an equal yeah. you know thing to be said on well, both sides of an issue and it's interesting and sometimes to s- there just isn't no but it's interesting to see is that I think that there was this period of time where people of that ilk thought they could come out and be and have their rallies because they thought that your Overton window had extended to them, that they now had acceptance within the political discourse. And so they came out at Charlottesville. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting to see is that ever since Charlottesville, you saw like 5,000 people in Vancouver came out to counter protest what ended up being 16 white dudes uh, who were angry about immigration. And so 5,000 people came out to tell them they were wrong. And now, because of that and other protests, counter protests throughout the United States, something like 36 rallies have been canceled in the United States because these groups have decided they're no longer welcome. And I think that's nominally great. And, and one thing that I, I find particularly heartening is that some corporations have stepped up and started yep. actively shutting down the accounts of white supremacists, mm-hmm. which is incredibly important mm-hmm. because fascism can only exist with support from the corporate world. Yep. And so the fact that corporate America is stepping up and doing the right thing is takes a little bit of the load of the giant pile of anxiety that I carry around with well, me since last it's, November, it's, so... It's, it's all of the money that gets made by advertising on Breitbart and, and the rebel media, where now the advertisers are one block. Oh, yeah, so and these, so we should, these... plug, we should plug Sleeping Giants right here. Mm, right. So Sleeping Giants is a uh, site that you can go to to uh, tell advertisers that their advertising through, like, the aggregator that they're using is being displayed on the rebel or Breitbart or other hate groups, uh, and is, uh, therefore, some Something they can do to actually cut funding off from yeah. these organizations, and so uh, if you you know happen to stop by the rebel every once in a while to you know see what madness uh, God hath wrought, uh, I choose to. Yeah, check out what advertising is is happening and uh, mention them to Sleeping Giants because people should not be advertising, and corporate action is incredibly important to society because that flow of capital means people have a voice, and we should ensure that people are not supported or people are not, like, through their dollar buying stuff that inadvertently supports white supremacy. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. It it is heartening to see, like, you know, the photo of City Hall surrounded by people um, protesting the um, the white supremacists. That was really nice to see. And and the other thing, I mean, as as repugnant as it 
has been to see the the Nazi rallies in um, in the U.S. South. It's also been really nice to see those statues come down and to recognize uh, that this is now a podium that you could put some other commemoration up. You could you could now um, celebrate some other important member of that community or just put up public art. And that that uh, to me represents a lot of hope. Well, I think you mentioned something about. Uh, I think you posted something about this. The the empty plinth project that yeah. happens in yeah. Trafalgar Square, uh, where of the four plinths that surround the square, there is one which doesn't have an equestrian statue on it, uh, and a different public art piece uh, goes up every once in a while uh, to just rotate and be an interesting piece of public art. I really like the horse skeleton. That was <laughs> that was pretty cool. I, I like the duck. It, it's an interesting mm-hmm. piece, and you should check it out. Right. So uh, a lot of this is, is sort of was ignited by bringing down those Confederate statues um, in the United States, and um, I think it's raised the, the point in Canada that we also have a lot of uh, commemorations of uh, historical figures who um, played a role in some racist um, actions and um, uh, policies and programs, and, and some people are speaking about perhaps we should uh, start changing those names or taking down those statues. So, for example, the, the statue of Judge Begbie in front of the law courts in Vancouver has been removed. Uh, the Langevin building was uh, renamed by the minister earlier this year. And Judge Begbie was the, the Canadian judge who was nicknamed the Hanging Judge by Indigenous community based on his, his rulings. That he- right. So is is there concern that this is going to spark some controversy in Canada and it's going to bring out the white supremacists? I don't know that there's concern. I'm excited about the controversy it's about to spark. Yeah. But okay. I, like, I think this is a debate we should be having because mm-hmm. what we choose to celebrate is very much who we like to think of as ourselves. Like, it, it yeah. represents what we like to think of ourselves. But um, what, one thing that I have about the United States' debate right now is there are a lot of statues in the U.S. Like, just a well, lot. They were, they, were, they, were, they were mass-produced for very low cost to be able to place in African-American communities as a terror. These are these are statues that were placed specifically to induce terror in a case. Right? Well, that, yes, true. But I've also visited, like, five Lincoln statues on the West Coast alone. So, uh... We have a Lincoln never fought to. Yes, <laughs> which is my point, is that, like, America has a lot more statuary than Canada does. Oh, you're saying we should have more statues. I'm just saying we should have more statues. In really, general. I'm just, I, you know, I, I can think of a lot more people. I'm not saying that we should, like, be erecting statues to, you know, uh, okay. Clifford Sifton or people like this. But, I, you know, Alberta does a pretty decent job of, of commemorating First Nations leaders. There was a statue of Crowfoot in the legislature. I, I, I like statuary as an art. And admittedly, I do run a podcast about theoretical statuary called the Mount Rushcast, which you can check out and op- updates occasionally. But uh, <laughs> shameless self-promotion. Uh, Isn't the last one like four months ago? It was four months ago. We've had some recording issues. Um, but but like what we choose to celebrate, and, and I think you can have complex celebrations of people, is, yeah. is important and it reflects something important in what people are telling about themselves. So when we're reevaluating whether or not a building should be renamed like Langevin Block or a statue should come down, uh, I, I think there should be some critical thought that goes into it to say, mm-hmm. why are we commemorating this person? What was the reason that they were commemorated in the first first place uh, and is that commemoration consistent with you know what their legacy has been to the country we had a I mean, we had a very similar conversation during the Canada 150 discussion mm-hmm. of like there is a, a history in this country that should be proud of, and there's a history in this country that should be known to be not proud that should be known and talked about as being something that we should not have done something that was a shame and a crime and harmed a lot of people and I think that those two things need to be maintained and so so should Langevin Bloc uh, still be named that despite the fact that he was the architect of the most horrific thing that our country ever did is like a genuine and real question. Sorry, I got hung up on the word crime in that and because I think that one of the things that we have to reckon with in society is that these acts were entirely legal. Right, okay, but legal or not, a lot of the time we wouldn't consider them to be the right thing to do mm-hmm. today. Like was, yeah, true, yeah, true Like enough. residential schools, the history of residential schools is the most, most horrific part of Canadian history. And the idea that we should continue to celebrate as that as one of the houses, like as one of the, the places of government, the man who invented the idea, uh, is to me something we should reconsider. No matter what else he may have done in his time. Yes, although we we also have instances like this Ontario Teachers Union local that is petitioning to have John A. McDonald's name removed.
removed from uh, the school in which they are teaching because he was involved in uh, the residential school system. And that, to me, is, I think, a more complicated discussion. Yeah. Because I don't think that's why we're commemorating John M. McDonald. At least it's not why I commemorate John M. McDonald. Um, and so I, I think that there has to be some, like, more concrete and more, more viable test as to, and, you know, I, I have a legal education, and so I like these kind of four-part test to, like, hash out certain issues, but, uh, because that's how the common law works, but the, the, those, who knows who Langevin is anymore, it's, uh, Anyway, go on. So we have a lot of schools in this, and almost all of them are named for white dudes. Uh, for example, Vancouver has a Sir Charles Tupper uh, school. Now, Sir Charles Tupper, I don't think he ever set foot in British Columbia. He was from Nova Scotia. He was a one-time prime minister for a blink of an eye, and he never really had any effect on British Columbia. But we have a school named after. Why isn't that school named after somebody from the community like Emery Barnes, uh, somebody from the, the, the first African-American cabinet minister in British Columbia history? Why isn't that school named after uh, Grace McCarthy? who actually, I think, similar geographic area is the area that she represented, who is the, the, the first leader, the first woman leader of a political party in D.C. Why isn't it named after somebody like that that's got a B.C. connection that isn't, you know, a, a white male, uh, rather than being named for somebody who never even saw the land at which the school is on? Yes, and, and I think that point is absolutely well taken, and I don't know why there is a Sir Charles Tupper uh, high school in British Columbia. That seems quite weird to me. I mean, across, and like I say, I think the prairies do a little bit of a better job of this because there is like 10 Louis Riel elementary schools that I am aware of and uh, there is a it, I went to a school in the Chief Crowfoot building um, we but at the same time I also want to like figure out a way that reevaluating our history doesn't involve us taking down statues of Nellie McClung because she wrote a particularly racist right. screed against black people and their inherent inferiority mm -hmm. well, in, yeah. sorry. Yeah. because that's not why we celebrate Nellie McClung yeah you know, I, this this debate has had me thinking about the famous five, um, the the women who fought for uh, white women to get the right to vote in Canada. Uh, Nellie McClung was one of them, and another one of those women was um, Emily Murphy. So uh, a few years ago, um, a women's shelter in Vancouver that was formerly called Emily Murphy House decided to change their name because Emily Murphy held some pretty racist beliefs, and um, I don't know if she wrote about them or acted on them, but th they came to the, the decision that it was unwelcoming for them to have a shelter where they were trying to um, look after women of all colors um, to, to to call that house a somebody who uh, after somebody who was racist and to me this issue is is about that it's about being welcoming and about being compassionate to other people's trauma and so if if John a McDonald is uh, generating some trauma for those Aboriginal students in some Ontario schools that's more important than than maintaining that name because John a McDonald gets a, a more than a enough airtime in terms of, you know, Canadian historical yeah. uh, commemorations. Well, I mean, the way that it was presented wasn't, like, on behalf of the students. It was a statement of policy from the teachers' union. Well, so I don't I don't know one way or the other. Like, I, I can certainly see... Was it, was it Johnny McDonald's hometown? Uh, was, no, I don't believe so. Had Johnny McDonald ever been to that place? I think it, it's about I, all I think the so. schools. Probably. Ontario. Possibly. Yeah, I, it's an Ontario... It was, like, a loyalist Ontario town. Okay. I think... What, what? Brantford, I think? Okay. It's... But the... the, but the the idea is still is still the salient there is is if he never had a real impact on that town specific why is he even there uh i disagree with that that sentiment i i think that we can commemorate people who don't have a direct historical connection to the land and certainly I, I think that we should have more statues and more commemorations and like any new building should evaluate like the history of the place but i i don't think that it's entirely inappropriate to name something after the queen or the prince of Wales just because uh, they, they haven't been around because like these are ideas that uh, are important to the way that we've structured our society and like whether or not people share those ideas is a discussion for the actual naming but I don't think that it's entirely inappropriate for um, like a, a school to name uh, for example if there was a school that wanted to name a themselves after Phil Fontaine or Viola Davis or uh, 
any other like notable Canadian figure from uh, across the country, I think that's valid within mm-hmm. their discussion. I think that the, the figure that they choose certainly s- makes a statement, but uh, the fact that they aren't local, uh, you know, should factor into it. But I don't think it should be the end all and be all. And I think too, the, the other thing though is that I think having that regular conversation, having that teachers union coming forward and saying maybe we shouldn't call this Johnny McDonald's in his history. Having I think a group came forward. I think one of the the, the First Nations bands came forward a couple of years ago and said that Stanley Park should be renamed after the original the uh, indigenous name. Mm, uh, no. And no, no, no the, hear me uh, out, hear me out. The, the the point is that we should have those conversations regularly and we should acknowledge the history of colonialism. We should acknowledge the hi- history of settlerism that resulted in the country that we live in now and we should talk about it regularly. Yeah. Although I think this is somewhat divorced from the the issue and the fight that is going on in the United States, which is like there is a bigger line in between well, Robert E. Lee and, well, yeah, but, and Stonewall Jackson, and but that's but that's the fallacy of Canadian politics. A it's horrible, horrible so person often, like Thomas but, Jefferson. But but that's the thing is that so often in Canadian politics we say, well, we're we're better than the United States, so we're okay. And I I, I don't I reject that. I think that just because our healthcare is better than the United States doesn't mean it can't be improved. Just because our our history of settler colonialism is better than the United States, ours is a more land terror. Yeah, and I think that we should look at how we can better ourselves, even if we are still better than the United States. It's a it's a, a pale reflection that we, that we shouldn't be looking at. Sure. But, yeah, and I think this does, like, stem back to our, our thoughts on Canada 150. Mm-hmm. Are there things that are celebrated about someone like William Lee Mackenzie King? Yes, and I think there are things to rightly be celebrated about him, but also Japanese internment, uh, and yeah. a ton of other horrible mm-hmm. stuff, like turning away boatloads of Jewish refugees. Refugees. Um, didn't mean to say boatloads of terrible stuff there. That was unintentional. Um, we, we have to find a way to examine and celebrate the good of history while still acknowledging the bad. Yeah, I think we agree with that. Absolutely, sure. And and I think it's important to note that um, removing a statue does not erase history. I, I don't think monuments and statues yeah. are, are the only way that we write down our history of our country, right? Well, but they uh, are the... part of nation building. And if we we want to change the way we see ourselves as Canadians, and we, if we really care about racial justice in this country, we should change the kind of monuments that we have. We should start having monuments. <laughs> More monuments. More monuments. There are <laughs> there are like hundreds of parks in Vancouver, and but like none of them have monuments in them. Dude Chilling Park had a dude chilling in it. Yeah, although I was there today. They it took it like away. I, know. I don't know what's happened to this. Um, this but is I, like I want to go back to that. Concerning. I think, I think Aaron, your point puts so well what I've been trying to think about for the last couple of days. Huzzah. Uh, yeah, like it's we statues are what we pretend our culture should be, and when we have endless statues to white dudes, we're telling everybody else that you should be a white dude, and unfortunately, that's impossible, and also really a bad message to send. Yeah, so hopefully this is the beginning of some better stuff, better statues and more statues. Mm-hmm. I, I I can think off the top of my head of a, a couple different people who deserve statues in BC who are not white: James Douglas, Rose Prince. No. Like these are yeah, no, no, we can name them off for. Ever, yeah, right? there's a pile of people that should be should be more Drake. celebrated than there. Yes, Drake. Is he from BC? Who you know about now? He sings. I don't know if he's ever been to Vancouver. Probably. He's definitely. He's definitely. Is he, is he Canadian? <laughs> We just had. Oh he's, my God. He is Canadian, right? I can't deal with this. Let's go to what? What are you thinking of? What else are you thinking about? Let's move on. Okay, uh, so we've talked about politics a lot today. Let's talk about something else. What have you guys been thinking about this week? Non-politics things. Uh, I have been thinking about the geology of the Arrow Lakes region of British Columbia. Uh, I had a chance to go and visit my parents, who were out vacationing at uh, Galena Bay on the Arrow Lakes, and I decided to take a geological tour of the Arrow Lakes while I was there, because that is something that I find fun. And apparently, everything from basically Nelson onwards uh, used to be these offshore volcanic islands that the North American plate just crushed into, uh, and then created the interior mountain range, uh, and created a lot of gold deposits in the interior. And also, uh, lake fjords, which are susceptible to lake tsunamis, uh, which are both really cool, because Whoa. they're like these deep glacial channels that have high walls, uh, and if uh, 
like fjords in Norway, and if anything falls off the side of these cliffs, uh, it can create lake tsunamis, which uh, has swamped a uh, sternwheeler boat called the Revelstoke in 1903. Lake tsunamis. Mm-hmm. A thing. Yes. Patrick? The more you know. <laughs> um, I'm frantically looking through my Facebook uh, chat history to see what the last non-political thing I thought about was, uh, and it turns out Game of Thrones. Uh, the last episode of Game of Thrones was pretty epic. Uh, I think people this is have more, some more opinions. <laughs> Uh, people have some firm opinions about it uh, and uh, I just want to say uh, my wife and I we have uh, a bunch of people over every week to watch it and we absolutely love having all the like 12 or 15 people that come over every week watch it together because it's a really neat sort of cultural event and for me uh, it's been pretty political but uh, the only thing I'm coming up with is the eclipse the eclipse is oh yeah amazing. that happened didn't it <laughs> yeah our, our once in a lifetime uh, total eclipse I, di- I didn't see the totality I watched it from work um, but I did make myself a little pin pole projector thing and that was really fun. I'd never done that as a child so I, I, I felt that sort of giddiness of discovery. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I made a big pinhole. Oh, I got the above. glasses things. Like, yeah. I just got the glasses on Amazon like a month ago and I watched it down by Science World with like a thousand other people. Nice. No, I, I had I had a, a box from a water heater uh, that I cut a hole in a pinhole projector so I have this giant box on my head uh, <laughs> for, for the eclipse. It was pretty cool, like, I gotta say. It was. I'm looking forward to the next uh, totality yeah. one, uh, which is going to be in 2024 in Toronto. That's the next nearby one. Oh, we have to go to Toronto. Yes. <laughs> Save your box thing. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it with you on the plane. Oh, are you? <laughs> even West Chad. Be careful. Be careful. United breaks guitars. Even, even West Chad is going to be charging extra bag fees by 2024 because, like, we have the worst airline industry. Just so. wear it on the plane. Oh, yeah. No, it's true. It's my car. article of clothing. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me see. <laughs> <laughs> Time to wrap this uh, this show. We've all kind of lost it. Uh, so we are Pod Keep Our Land. We are a show about politics, parliaments, policy, and politicians. We're broadcasting to you from Vancouver, BC. My name's Aaron Rennie. I'm Matthew Naylor, and I'm Patrick Meehan. You can find us on everywhere you find podcasts. You can find us on the social media. Please follow us. Please comment. Please review. Please let us know what you think. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. And I need, <laughs> need you more tonight. <laughs> and I need, need you more yeah, than ever. Happening.